You've earned your social work degree and you're ready to get your social work license. Congratulations. An important part of the licensing process is passing the social work licensing exam. Taking your social work licensing exam requires three steps. Apply for your license with the state or provincial social work board where you'll practice. Register with ASWB and schedule your exam at a Pearson View Test Center. This video gives you a quick overview of these steps. More details are in the Examination Candidate Handbook, available for free at ASWB.org. Read it before you start your application. First, apply for your license from the State or Provincial Social Work Board. Because the Social Work Boards issue licenses, they must approve you to take the licensing exams. Most boards charge an application fee. Contact the board for the details. The Social Work Board will notify you when you're approved to register for the exam. Check the approval notice for the expiration date. Next, register for the exam online at ASWB.org or by phone. When you register, you'll need to pay your exam registration fee and answer some questions about your education and demographic information. ASWB will then send you an authorization test email. This email is very important. It says which exam you'll be taking, when your exam registration expires, and how to schedule your exam. Finally, schedule your exam with Pearson View. Then go to the test center and take the exam. You'll get an unofficial printout of your results immediately. Your board will receive your official results within two weeks. Now you have the big picture. Download the candidate handbook to get the details. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Michaela, if you can, I'll, I'll start sharing my uh, screen in a minute. Um, let me, I, I do have some uh, housekeeping um, things I want to cover before we get started. So I, I'll start out by welcoming everyone. Um, my name is Anwar Naja Durak. I am the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs at Wayne State University School of Social Work. And um, this is uh, a panel discussion that we uh, decided to offer uh, that focuses on the ASWB exam. Um, uh, we have a panel of four folks who have taken and passed the exam who will uh, be sharing their wisdom, what worked and didn't work for them, and some suggestions for all of you. Before we do that, um, I'm gonna be going over some, some um, general things about the exam, uh, but, but again, before I do that, let me just, uh, there already, I see some questions about whether we'll share this. Uh, we are video, we're recording this, so please be mindful, we are recording this, and um, we also will send, we'll post this on our website so people have access to it, and we will share the PowerPoint that we'll be using, um, uh, we'll send that out for folks as well. So, so I think, uh, just kind of be mindful of that. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, uh, for best results, we'll ask folks to please keep their uh, Zoom muted so that when folks are presenting, you can hear them. Um, so that'll be helpful. I do have colleagues on the call that are helping to keep track of the chat so that I'm not distracted. I won't look at that. Uh, I'll have them uh, keep track and answer questions. The questions they are not able to answer, they'll keep track of and when it's time for Q&A, we'll ask those questions. and the panelists can answer them or uh, I can answer if, if need be. Um, just, some of you are graduates of our program uh, from this May, so May of 2020, the, those of you that just graduated from the MSW program, um, the school sent out a survey to those individuals, so I would ask you to please check your email if you've already responded to that survey. Thank you, if you didn't, we ask that you please uh, respond to that survey. It's an attempt of, for us to um, get an idea about the supports that you might need for licensure. We're looking at the possibility of putting together a, a, um, a support system, including alums who have taken this exam, who have passed it, who would be willing to serve as mentors to support gra new graduates to help them uh, move towards uh, completion and passing of this exam. So the survey will ask you to share some of your experiences and feedback and, and what you'd like to do. So again, uh, please look for that. We are sending another survey for graduates who graduated in 2016, 17, and 18. And also that is going to be a survey that will ask those grads 
about their experience in our program because we are looking at changing our curriculum and asking you about your feedback of what kinds of supports you might need um, as we look at putting together programs to help uh, alums, um, again, move towards successful completion of this exam. All right, so with all of that being said, um, uh, um, let me go sorry. ahead and... Sorry. There's a question in the chat. Um, they're asking, what is the difference between the master's and clinical exam? Uh, U of M offers an online prep course, but only offer the master's and advanced generalist exams. So we will, let, let me go ahead and, and start because some of those questions are going to be um, answered through the presentation. And then if they're not, we'll, we'll get back to them. So, so this, this, this presentation is really going to talk about the, uh, the exam. And there are two exams, and it's going to focus on the master's level. So let me go ahead and get started. Let me, let me share my screen, and then I think that will help people. Um, hang on one second. This thing tends to be a little slow. Share screen. Can you see my screen? That's not telling me that you can. Can people see my screen? Oh, oh not yet. Okay, here we go. Okay. How about now? Yes. Yep, we can okay. see it now. Very good. <laughs> All right, so um, this. There we go. All right, so. I, please note that the focus of our, when I talk about licensing, I am, I am going to be talking about licensing in Michigan. Obviously, um, other jurisdictions, uh, all jurisdictions in the United States and many provinces in Canada require licensure, and there are variations in each jurisdictional um, uh, area. And I'll just stop a minute and remind folks to please mute your line to, so that we can help everyone here the presentation. Um, so again, all jurisdic many jurisdictions have similar requirements, but there are some differences. I've gotten some emails from folks saying, after I graduate, I'm going to be moving to Florida or Arizona or California. So it is important that you reach out to the, to the Board of Social Work in the jurisdiction where you're going to move, be moving to to find out what is required. It is important to note that the exam that you're going to take is the same exam. So if you took it and passed it in one jurisdiction, you do not repeat it again in another jurisdiction. You, you would be able to have the ASWB send your exam pass rate to that jurisdiction, but you would have to fill out the application process in the jurisdiction where you're going to be applying to and, and meet their guidelines and fees and things like that. So Michigan licensing board i the Re licensing and regulatory affairs is the bureau the area in, in the, at the state of michigan where you would be uh, submitting your application if you wanted to be licensed in the state of michigan and michigan is a um we have a protected um license in the sense that we have what we call title protection and practice protection you have to be licensed to practice and to call yourself a social worker if you don't if you aren't um, licensed, then, then it, would, it, it really is a felony in Michigan to say you're a, a social worker and to practice social work without that license. So important to be aware of that. The Association of Social Work Boards is, um, is a nonprofit association that provides support uh, services to, to regulatory bodies. So this, the Board of Social Work uh, in Michigan uh, is one of the members of ASWB. They, so they are they use the license that ASWB puts together. So they are an independent nonprofit association that provides support to regulatory bodies like uh, the state of Michigan licensing and regulatory affairs. Um, they, as you can see, they uh, provide services to all of the states in the United, in the United States, Washington D.C., the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, and then ten Canadian provinces. So just kind of an FYI to give you a sense of who ASWB is uh, in, the, in the scheme of things. So um, again, we're, although ASWB provides bachelor's as well as master's exams, this presentation will focus on the MSW exams. You have to pass either the clinical exam or the advanced generalist exam 
uh, depending on which license you're applying for in the state of Michigan. Michigan allows you to apply for your LMSW clinical or LMSW macro. And so obviously for the clinical, you'd be taking the clinical exam. If you apply for the um, macro license designation, then you'd be taking the advanced generalist exam. Um, so there's a lot of information about licensing that is not a part of this presentation. We're really going to focus on the exam. So if folks have questions about licensing, we have information on our website and I would encourage you to look at that um, for information because we wanted to spend this time really looking at the exam. So I'm going to take the next couple of slides and then I'll introduce our, introduce our panelists. So the exam that you take has 170 multiple choice questions and they're all multiple choice. 20 of them are non-scored items. That means they're, they're being tested. They, they put them in there to test them to see if everybody, um, uh, if, if they're good questions. If a lot of people don't get them right, they get pulled and then they're reviewed again to determine if they are good questions or not. So, but even though you answer them, they're not part of your total score. You're only scored on 150 of the items that you take uh, of the 170, uh, but you don't know which ones the, are the 20 because they're all mixed in together. Uh, they do that so that they can test them, obviously. So I, I, I put this slide on here because I think it's important to think about um, the kinds of questions that they ask. And you'll hear our colleagues on the panel talk about their experiences. But I will tell, and I've said this to many of you that I've spoken with, that this is, this is an exam that I think engenders a lot of anxiety, right? And it's one of those exams that does not um, have, um, it, it, where you look at it and say, this is the right answer. Because in many questions, you read it and, and it appears that, that every answer is correct. And so you really have to read the question. And there are typically three types of questions on this exam. Um, and, and so, um, let me just move this a little bit here so I can read my, here we go. Um, so there are, um, um, three types of questions that, and, and it's important to note, so when you're looking at a question uh, or as you're preparing for this exam, the level one questions are, are identified as recall questions. These are um, questions, and, as you, and I'll, I don't want to read for you, but they, these are like you have to basically remember something, keep something to, in your memory to be able to answer the question. You have to think about what you learned or what you read to be able to answer the right questions. So, you know, it might be like um, when you're looking at someone who has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, how long do they have to, to, to uh, experience symptoms to have that diagnosis? And the DSM is very specific. It has like a specific number of weeks you have to have those symptoms in order to have that. So that's an example of a recall question. You have to know something and to be able to answer the question. Those are probably the easiest questions because you will have, you know, practiced and learned um, uh, to be able to answer that. The second level questions are application questions. This is where you use information in a very straightforward manner and you uh, look at material and you're able to apply it to a specific situation that they describe in the question and uh, be able to answer the question based on uh, understanding what they're asking. Uh, so it'll include applying rules, methods, concepts, principles, laws, or theories. So they might use, might say something like, according to the rule of X, what would be the second important thing that you have to be mindful of when you treat someone with da-da-da? And so if you know that rule, you're able to answer that question. The third level of question, and I think these are the most difficult questions, are the reasoning questions. And the reasoning questions really require you to use critical thinking skills. You have to use information and you have to think about the context the question is being asked and you have to know um, what is available based on what is being asked. And I, I think this is the question that always reminds me to tell students that, uh, or students and alums, these, these questions are not, are based on best practices. So when they ask the question and ask you to select an answer, people say, well, you know, they said the answer was A, but where I work, we would have done B. And the important thing to be mindful of is it's the question was created based on best practices. So the person who created that question had to show 
what they looked at, what research said about that situation. And a good example for this would be, they give a, like a question gives you a, 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 a stem that describes a situation. And then they say, in this situation, what would be the first thing that you would do? And I remember someone saying, there was a question on the exam that gave an example of a situation and they asked if, if what would be the first thing I would do? And the answer was to file a 3200, a child abuse neglect um, complaint. But I wouldn't have done that where I worked at. And I said, yeah, but, but what does research say? If research says that that situation suggests that a child was at risk and the best way to respond to that is to file the complaint, uh, to file the 3200, that's the answer. It's not it's based on, yes, practice wisdom, but also based on what research says is the best way to respond to a situation. So that's the reasoning questions require that you break the material down, you use your judgment, and you um, identify what is being asked, analyze it, and then decide the best answer based on all of the things that I mentioned. So um, I'm sure our colleagues will say more about that. Um, and, and one uh, important, obviously, to, um, to note that this exam uses a 10th grade level reading, but that doesn't count the um, social work uh, terms that they use on there. Um, ASWB say that the, the questions really require problem solving, which requires critical thinking skills, which is why I always say to students, really, a great way to improve your critical thinking skills is to engage in your classes and with your faculty and, it, and when you graduate with your supervisor and others, because those are the skills that are going to help you most, I think, uh, when you take this exam. And then, of course, uh, a huge area is anxiety management. Um, I can't tell you the number of people I've spoken to whose anxiety levels rise, as do mine. These are not exams I love taking, and so before I even get into these, my anxiety shoots up. And when we use our energy using being anxious, we're not using it in a way to focus on the exam. So you really have to think about how you're going to manage your anxiety so that it doesn't get in the way of your, of your ability to use your skills and your energy to do well on this exam. Um, lots of ways to do that, obviously. And I said the cost is 260, who wants to take it again or a third time for that matter? And this is, I think, my last slide, which I, I will just say that, um, our, our license is, you know, we can't practice without the license, so it's important that we take responsibility for what we need to do to prepare, being mindful of the rules, the expectations, um, and obviously uh, thinking about what, what you need to do uh, to prepare for it and, and your commitment, not just to, to, to this exam, but for professional development moving forward. All right. I'm gonna, I, that's kind of the, I wanted to give you a backdrop before I, I asked our panelists to, to uh, move forward. And um, so I, what I'd like to do next is to introduce our panelists. So I'm just gonna, I asked them to give me really quick introductions. So I, I'm gonna read these and then I'm gonna turn it over to each of them and each of them will, will do like a five or so minute presentation and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. So our first, and I, I have folks um, here uh, listed alphabetically. So our first uh, panelist is uh, Lakidra Bronner, who's a school social worker for Detroit Public Schools. And uh, she um, has previous experience working at, uh, at the intersection of social work and higher education and community mental health. Um, and she passed the exam, I wanna say, Lakidra. In December, that. December 2019. Oh. Very good, December. Um, uh, Elena Brown, uh, who is an adult services specialist working for Department of Health and Human Services. She's a licensed clinical social worker who received her MSW from Wayne State in the spring of 2015. Currently, she works full-time serving adults and disabil um, with disabilities and with uh, the aging population. She provides therapeutic services to individuals committed to reaching their well-being goals, and she Past the exam, I want to say 2018, if I'm correct. Um, That's and, correct. And, great. And it was the clinical, and it was the clinical exam for you as well, Lakidra, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Aubrey Gilliland. Uh, Aubrey is a utilization management uh, specialized at, um, at at children's uh, the Children's Center, TCC. She's a macro social worker who received her MSW from Wayne State 
In 2018, her special interest areas are in childhood trauma and behavioral health, and her passion, which I love, lies in the world of program development and evaluation. Outside of her career at the Children's Center, she sits on the Michigan Association for Evaluation Board of Directors as the Student Emerging Professional Representative. Um, so happy to have all three of you. And then lastly, certainly not the least, is Brooke Rodriguez, who's a research assistant in the School of Social here at Wayne State. She um, uh, serves as a grant evaluator on a youth treatment grant in partnership with also the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. She graduated in 2018 with her degree in macro leadership practice. And I think Brooke is uh, just passed the exam, um, I want to say less than a month ago. I'll have her yes, share that. Last month. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And um, so that with all of that, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank all four um, presenters uh, for being here. And I'm going to turn it over and ask uh, Lakidra to, to go ahead and get started. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm really excited to speak with you about passing the exam. Um, I'm a little nervous, so if you hear some shakiness in my voice, I mean, we've all been quarantined and not really having so much interaction, so bear with me. Um, so again, my name is Lakeidra Bronner. I'm currently working as a school social worker with um, Detroit Public Schools. I started in this role in January, and before that, I worked for about a year and a half at Michigan State as an academic advisor for um, TRIO Student Support Services. And we service students who were from low income, first generation and students with disabilities. So um, that's my background. Um, so Anwai, if you could hit the next slide. Thank you. So um, just to give you all some background, again, I did graduate um, from my MSW program at U of M in 2017, um, December 2017. And so it took me a full two years um, to actually take the exam. I had graduated and I was like, I'm going to knock this thing out before, you know, I start work. Let's get it done. And as Anwa mentioned, anxiety just was on my back. Um, I just kept delaying and delaying. And um, like I said, ultimately, I took it in December 2019. Um, so my plan to prepare for the exam, um, I created a study schedule. Um, I took flex time from my job when I was working at Michigan State. Um, I was able to take afternoons off on Friday, um, four hours in the afternoon to study, study for the exam. Um, I downloaded free resources from online groups and peers, which we'll talk about um, in a couple slides. I also blocked out time every evening to go over questions um, and review rationale and things. And then I identified an accountability partner. Um, Actually, I think one of them is on this call right now. We checked in on each other throughout our study time. So um, if you could hit the next slide. All right, so what worked well? Um, so again, the daily study schedule, um, I tried to come up with one on my own. It's really easy to do, but again, the anxiety kind of freaked me out. So I spoke with a coach with AATBS. Um, it was a free call, and I was able to talk with someone and kind of highlight every week what I needed to work on. Um, something to highlight about this is that while I was working at Michigan State, um, I wasn't in a super um, cut and dry clinical role. So I felt like a lot of the, um, I guess, information and um, education I had gained in a clinical um, setting that I was in for my internship had kind of faded. Um, you know, I was talking to students, but I wasn't um, textbook clinical. So a lot of that I needed to review. So I was able to work with that coach to kind of, you know, highlight, okay, this week, I need you to review personality disorders. The next week, we're going to talk about, you know, program evaluation or whatever. Um, so that was very helpful. Um, the next thing was reviewing practice questions from a variety of online resources. So um, as you'll see later on in the presentation, I did list some of the places where I found practice um, questions, but what helped for me was the Pocket Prep app on your phone. You can download that. Um, I paid for the, I think it's a $40 upgrade, and you have access to about a thousand extra questions. So I was doing um, Pocket Prep questions every day. Um, even on my lunch break at work, I would do a quick 10 um, practice exam on my phone. Um, but the important piece about that is being able to break down the question and analyzing the structure of the question. So um, 
I would literally go through and underline the important parts of the question and pull out um, the things that I need to pay attention to. Because again, my anxiety, I will look at the big paragraph and then my brain would just go to mush. So um, definitely underlining and reading through, asking yourself, you know, what are they really asking me? And then if you get the question wrong, or even if you get it right, just reviewing the rationale for that question and getting at what exactly they're asking you and wrapping your mind around that. Um, another thing that worked well for me is avoiding the couch. Um, I, every time my bottom hit that couch, my eyes went shut. <laughs> you know, I was exhausted after working a full day. So I had to find a place that was conducive to studying. So um, sometimes I would go downstairs from my apartment to study in the coffee shop. Um, you know, I would stay after work and study in the campus buildings, but just, you know, a place where I could make sure I was sitting upright. Um, I was locked in and actually focused on what I needed to do. Um, and the last thing is accountability partner and mentor again. So like I said, um, I'm in a group chat with some of my friends from grad school and we were on each other's case about, you know, when are you taking the exam? Are you studying? Let's have a study group. Um, and then in addition to that, um, I have a mentor who every time I would meet with her, she's like, okay, pull out your pocket prep. Let's do 10 questions. And she stayed on top of me as well. Next slide. Thank you. All right. What didn't work? So again, um, an undefined undefined time frame for studying. So again, I told you all, um, I purposely said I was studying um, starting last January 2019. So I was like, all right, it's time to lock in. I'm going to take this exam. I scheduled my exam, I believe, for March. Then I moved it to May. Then I moved it to August. And I just kept pushing it back. And ultimately, I ended up taking it in December. But the um, bottom line is that you definitely don't want to go any longer than three months actually full on intentionally studying. Um, so once I locked in, I locked in in uh, October and really nailed down a study schedule and really focused in on studying. Uh, the study groups, those were a, a gift and a curse for me. Um, again, with my anxiety around taking this exam, being in a group where my peers were getting the questions and understanding the rationale and I was having a hard time, it was kind of hitting on my confidence. So I had to take some time to study on my own. Um, so, you know, I say all this to say determine what kind of learner you are. If you do better in, you know, group settings and kind of building off each other, then that's great. But for me personally, um, I worked much better on, on my own. And then lastly, like I mentioned, <laughs> avoiding the couch, um, studying on a tired brain, that's a no-go. So if, you know, you have to fit, fit in your study schedule around your work, um, you know, maybe you need to come home and take an hour nap or, you know, um, go and grab a coffee from Starbucks or something. But make sure you're not studying on a tired brain because you're not retaining that information. It's kind of like you're just going through the motions and nothing is sticking. And next slide, please. All right, so again, best recommendations. The first one is break down the question and don't overthink. So <laughs> over, don't overthink is like easier said than done for sure. But um, again, just if you get the question, you know, it's a huge paragraph like this. You wanna underline, okay, it says this person has been experiencing these symptoms for three months, underline that. It says, you know, they're um, feeling sad, feeling hopeless, underline, you know, underlining the important pieces of the question and not pulling in outside thoughts. So you're like, well, three months, well, I wonder, you know, I'm a person who will add in extra things to the story. You wanna go with what's in that question and that's it. Um, the next bullet is practice, practice, practice. Um, again, just I maybe took four or five different practice exams. I was taking practice exams on my phone. I mean, I had a variety of exams that I was looking at. So I would say just drill those practice questions um, even if you're getting them wrong, you're still learning the information when you're reading the rationale. And then pocket prep does a good thing. It shows you um, the green when you're getting your questions right. So, of course, that can be a confidence boost as well. Um, frequent brain breaks during the test time. So this was a, a cheat code for me. So someone told me to make sure that you are getting up and going to the restroom while you're taking the exam. Even if you don't have to use the restroom, just getting up 
walking around just to reset your brain because you're locked into that exam screen and then you start to um, get tired. So I took maybe about four bathroom breaks during my um, exam, maybe once to actually use the restroom. Um, but it did help in resetting my energy um, and getting me back on track with the exam. And lastly, um, answer your flag question. So um, on the exam, you, you have the option to flag a question to return to and, you know, revisit. But always make sure you click the answer that you think it is. Don't leave it blank in, in case you do run out of time. Um, and I believe that's it. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. Elena, I think you're up next. Yes. Can you all hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I first off, um, I would say that I really didn't have a plan. I had a goal and that was to pass the test, but that was pretty much the extent. Um, I did graduate in 2015 and I didn't take my exam until 2018, um, but I'm grateful for all that time because I passed on the first try. So while for some, it's totally great for you to do it right after you graduate because it, it just works for you. For others, that just might not be the case, and that's okay. I want you to give yourself grace and just make sure you're being really intentional about what works best for you. So you can go to my first slide. So for me, what worked well? Um, I was able to get a supervisor and meet regularly, and that was important for me because it provided some accountability. It gave me opportunities to discuss any knowledge gaps that I had because um, again, it had been a little while since I was in school, so that was helpful. Also, my supervisor was able to give me articles um, and other resources, study questions, et cetera, to work on my own time, just to make sure that I'm continuing to move forward, even when it doesn't seem like I am. Um, and then lastly, the importance for me of supervision, of course, is just overall personal development and professional development. It's vitally important to take the test. Obviously, that's um, a big portion of being licensed. However, we have to remember that we're about to be social workers and there's other components to it other than cramming for an exam and passing it, okay? So, so next, I did join a study group that allowed for some more accountability. And while sometimes we, we may not have gotten as much work done as we would have liked, I think it was ultimately important for us to come together, have a little structure. Um, during those times, we, we did test like in a timed a timed way. So we'll have like 10 or 15 questions and choose, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to try to get through some of those questions. And then after we would discuss those, those answers, you know, what we got right, what we got wrong. And when we think about a study group, I think it's important to select your members, you know, what's best for you. We want people that's challenging each other, but of course being respectful and creating a space where everybody's moving forward and getting their goals met as a unit. So again, accountability um, with your cohorts, partnerships, et cetera. Um, lastly, taking, uh oh, sorry, could you go back? Thank you. Taking the practice, practice exam at Wayne State. So I actually took mine twice or took it twice. Um, once right after I graduated, and then lastly, right before I took my exam. So although it, it wasn't the most fun experience, it did provide me with the opportunity to, to learn some anxiety um, skills, combating anxiety, I should say, and allow for me to just get an idea of, of timing, how I was doing with my timing, was I rushing? Um, and then, of course, you have the opportunity to write down certain things that might be a little tricky for you if you're still struggling. Um, so I do think it's important to at least take that test once if it's available for you, but I took it twice and I think that that really worked out for me. Um, what didn't work? Spending a lot of money. Now I, I'm pretty frugal, but I, I do know some of my cohort counterparts spending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and I could keep saying hundreds a lot more times, of dollars, and they still didn't take the test. And, and it's just like, we want to make sure we're, we're being smart about our money. I don't think it's really necessary to spend a lot of money in order to um, pass the exam, but rather, what are you doing with the resources that you already have? So really, really, really be mindful about that. Um, next, prioritizing other people's thoughts and plans above your own. So I think it's important to uh, converse with your cohorts, people who have already taken the exams. But what works for one person might not work for you. And it's vitally important that you really sit down with yourself and say, hey, in the past when I've taken standardized tests, 
what worked for me, what didn't work for me, and utilize that and allow that to, to help you to plan and to study appropriately. And then lastly, what didn't work is doing nothing. So, you know, like I'm sure a lot of you all are doing, you're working, you're, you know, maybe raising kids, you're getting married, there's a ton of things that could be happening right now. And um, it's easy for um, planning for the test to, to get lower and lower on your priority list. So just make sure doing nothing is, is, I don't think that's really an option. And I want you to keep that in mind, even if it's just collecting resources, that's doing something. Even if it's you just going to your, you know, doing supervision two or three times a month, that's doing something. So make sure you're constantly, you know, immersing yourself in something so that it stays on the top of your brain, even when we're busy. We can go to the next one. Oh, thank you. And then best recommendations for success. Again, be intentional. I'm confident that all of you all want to take your test and pass it. Um, just be intentional with your time. Be mindful that, that you are your greatest resource. So you need to make sure that you tap into the things that you know about yourself, maybe some of your struggles. I know some of us have anxiety. So we might need to work through that, right? Whether that's with our supervisor, whether that's with family, whether that's with our therapist, right? We need to try to work through some of those things in hopes that we can come up, come out on the other end. Um, consider both your strengths and your and your barriers, right? So again, you know, um, certain areas of knowledge you might be more strong on the, than others. You want to keep that in mind. Um, if you know you have a busy schedule or a stressful job. You want to keep that in mind. So that might look like, hey, I need to take off two days before the test rather than just, you know, leave early. We want to be mindful of all of those things and take that into account. Um, practicing testing. So again, I did practice on the computer at Wayne State twice, but also a lot of the um, practice, practice books that we all buy, they have practice tests at the end of of those books. So even if you allowed it some time and say, hey, give yourself a four hour gap and take the, the test on a you know, paper and a pen, um, try to do that before your test just so you can get in the habit of sitting down, sitting for four hours, focusing, reading, et cetera, et cetera. And then lastly, utilize all resources available to you. So again, I'm not with the idea of spending a lot of money. So see what resources you can grab that are low cost or free, preferably. Um, there's free study material online. If you know people that, you know, recently graduated or recently passed their test, they might be willing to give you a discount on some of the resources that they have. Um, so, so just keep that in mind. Make sure we are utilizing our supervisors and mentors, our cohorts, any free uh, study material. I did, I think Facebook has something called PassPro. I used that and I also used Pocket Prep, but again, I didn't spend any money on that. I just used the free versions of both of those things and it seemed to work out pretty well for me. So best wishes to all of you and, and I'm confident that you'll be okay. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Elena, that was great. Uh, let's see. Aubrey, you're up. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Aubrey Gilliland. I am a macro social worker. I work at the Children's Center in their quality and compliance department. So I, um, I took the advanced generalist exam in March, so just a few months ago, and my graduation date was in May of 20. 18. So I took it just or just under two years after I graduated. So my plan to prepare, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about some of these bullet points in the next couple slides. But the first thing that I did was set my exam date. I knew um, I was really strategic when thinking through when I should take the exam because I know in the summertime and in the fall, I'm incredibly busy and I want to be spending my time outside or with my family or with my friends. So I knew that scheduling the exam for me in the fall or summer wouldn't have been successful. So I scheduled my exam in March, knowing that in January and February, my schedule is typically wide open, so I was going to have a lot of time there to study and devote my, my time outside of work to study. 
Um, and then I created a study schedule. And so I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide on what worked well. Um, I only used the ASWB exam guidebook and their practice exam. So the guidebook, it, it was for the generalist exam and that the guidebook itself had all of the KSAs, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they are out, that are outlined through all of the exam. And then it also includes a practice exam. So I actually had access to two practice exams. And then throughout studying, I took notes and then I used index cards. Also flashcards are always helpful for me when um, trying to learn new concepts and definitions and um, key terms. And then I studied for about two months leading up to the exam. Thanks. So for what worked well for me, I, when I set my study schedule, I picked two days of the week that I felt like were going to be um, the most beneficial days for me to study. So I picked Wednesday evenings and Sunday mornings, and I devoted every Wednesday and every Sunday to studying with four hour time blocks studying each time. So I know one of the recommendations in the ASWB guidebook is to sit down for four hour time blocks to get you get yourself used to studying that long or sitting that long sitting for that long of a time because that's how long the exam actually is. Um, so I study at a coffee shop and I know that right now um, I recognize that maybe studying at a coffee shop or somewhere out in the community is not an option for you um, because of the current pandemic. So what's really important is being in a space that is comfortable and distraction free. So whether that's in your bedroom or at your kitchen table or outside or wherever that is for you, you wanna make sure that it is comfortable, you're able to sit there distraction free and hold yourself accountable um, for however long you're planning on sitting down to study for. I um, also had a friend who was taking the exam, luckily, around the same time as me. And so whenever we were stuck on a certain concept or question on the practice exam, we would sit down and talk about it. And we would talk through and really, um, really work through those difficult concepts. And just talking and speaking out loud was really helpful for me. And then also just taking the ASWB practice exam was really helpful. So I took two practice exams and at the end of the practice exam, there is this score guide. So you'll score your exam and each question falls within a certain category. And so it, if you use that guide, it'll help you show, it'll show you the areas that you need to improve on, whether it's human behavior or um, research, whatever area it is, ethics, it will show you specifically the number of questions that you got right and the questions that you got wrong that fall within that area. And so that was really helpful for me because it helped me identify, this is the area that I really need to focus my studying on. Next slide. So what didn't work for me? So trying to study before I set my exam date. I think it was Lakidra who also said at first she was studying and um, tried to study, but then would procrastinate and put it off, put it back, put it off, put it, put it off. So before I um, took my exam in March, I had this idea that I was gonna take the exam in the fall of 2018 after I had graduated. And so I started to study, but I didn't set my exam date and then I just kept putting off studying and putting off studying until the fall had come and gone and it was winter and then I still hadn't had an exam date. So I really, I knew that one, when I set my exam date, this is the date that I was gonna stick to and I have to hold myself accountable. So for me, for me if I didn't set my exam date, I, I wouldn't have been successful. Um, what also didn't work when I first started trying to study was not having a schedule laid out because I couldn't, again, couldn't hold myself accountable. 
Um, I didn't feel that, I, I tried to use some non-ASWB study guides and applications like Pocket Prep, and I didn't feel that they were helpful for me. Um, one of the things, one of the um, downsides to Pocket Prep is that sometimes the questions will start to repeat themselves, which I didn't feel um, was helpful, but I, but I do know that it does include the, um, the like the reasoning behind the answer of the question, which which is which could be helpful to some of you. And then another thing that didn't work for me was studying at home. So unfortunately, this this might not be an option. You might only be able to study at home at this time. But again, like I said earlier, it's really important to put yourself in a, an environment, no matter where you're at that is comfortable and distraction free for you. And so if that's, if you're living with other people, maybe it's communicating with them and saying, hey, I need to study during this time, please don't um, interrupt me. Or if you need something like, set a process with the people in your household to make sure that they are also respecting um, your studying time while you're at home. And then my best recommendations, so create a study schedule that works for you and stick to it. And con um, consistency is really important here because um, you wanna make sure that you're really dedicating your time and energy to um, studying and studying well. And also just um, what, again, make sure that it works for you. It doesn't have to be twice a week like it was for me. Lakidra said she studied um, several nights a week. So if that's what works for you, then that's what works for you. Don't spend too much energy trying to learn every um, KSA or knowledge, skills, and abilities in detail. So for me, um, there's one section of the exam that includes medication. And I remember I spent so much time trying to learn every single medication and what each medication was for, which diagnosis it was for, and what it treated and the side effects. And I, and I realized, I was like, I'm spending way too much energy on this topic that was only going to have maybe one or two questions on it, on the exam. So be mindful of that. You want to think, maybe think broader, more broad topics, and also remember the problem solving process the acronym E-A-P-I-E-T, um, engage, assess, plan, intervene, evaluate, and terminate. The problem solving process and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those are some major concepts that you will probably use throughout several scenario questions on the exam. And then just remember, trust yourself and stay confident You've got this, you've spent a lot of time, you spent two years or more in school. Just do the best you can, go get a good night's sleep, eat breakfast, wake up early, stay hydrated, drink your coffee, your tea, whatever you need, and just trust your gut because you're gonna do amazing. That's it for me. Uh, thank you so much. All right, Brooke, you're up. Okay, I am so sorry, you guys. I did not write down my tips. I dropped the ball there, but I have um, written them down myself, and I can email them to Anwar after this. But um, so I have some background noise, so please excuse Bryce. Um, we're doing the best we can without daycare. So um, I took the exam with a toddler, so I can tell you, you know, prioritize your exam. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, I will tell you, I did have to retake the exam. Um, and I'll talk about that. Um, so I'll start with the best tip I ever got was to take practice exams. That's how I studied. Um, that's the only way I studied. Um, I didn't find outlines helpful to me. Um, I use the two ASWB exams that are on Wayne's library and we link to that after this. Um, those were so helpful. Um, the questions were so similar to what I actually saw in the exam. Um, I can't tell you enough how important those were to me. Um, they, they just helped me um, learn how to answer the questions. Um, and I utilized both the macro and the micro exams. I took the macro exam, um, but I found the micro questions um, helped me learn. Um, I got micro questions on my exam, so I needed to know how to answer those. Um, so I did both. 
Um, but also I would say, keep in mind, um, you can get overwhelmed with study materials. I mean, I had binders and binders and binders. That wasn't helpful, it overwhelmed me. Um, so, you know, I took about seven or eight practice exams um, and that, I mean, that really helped me. Um, getting to uh, my next point, stay calm. Um, I panicked when I took the exam the first time, I can tell you that, I freaked out. Um, and I don't usually do that, so that was interesting for me. Um, I was focusing on the pass rate, the fail rate, um, statistics, you know, that kind of thing. None of that matters. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, I missed it by three questions the first time. So um, I think that when I went back to my flag questions, I changed answers I shouldn't have. Um, and I think that's what cost me. Um, so trust your first instinct. Um, don't go back and change things. You know, um, the second time around, um, I only flagged questions I didn't have an answer for. Um, and that was it. Um, and I passed it by 10 the next time. So, you know. Um, during the exam, if I felt overwhelmed, it is a long exam, but you have a lot of time. So I would sit there for a minute or two um, and just calm down, breathe, you know, that kind of thing. Going to the restroom is a good, um, a good suggestion. I didn't feel comfortable doing that, and I'll talk about that. Um, but just sitting there for a second and not looking at the screen, that, I mean, I did that four or five times. That was huge. I mean, I was able to refocus and calm down. Um, so I did take the exam with COVID measures in place. Um, I felt it was an easy process. I felt safe. Um, when you walk to the door, you have to go to the bathroom and wash your hands. Then you have to sanitize when you get there. Um, they were constantly um, wiping down. Um, every person was spaced evenly apart, um, but there was only three of us testing when I was in there. Um, and I didn't find the sanitizing to be disruptive or anything. I did have to wear a mask the whole time. Um, that was a little difficult um, for me. Um, it did get a little stuffy, but you know, um, you just kind of have to deal with it at this point. Um, but I didn't find it disruptive. I was able to get through it and that kind of thing. Um, and my last point would be to take your time and read. You have four hours. Um, I was able to do the exam in two and a half, um, but you have to read very carefully because one word can change the entire question. Um, I do agree with um, when you're practicing on underlining things. I did that a lot. Um, what's the key word? Um, there'll be a word in a question and that's what they're looking for. So learning how to answer the questions, um, that's huge. That's a huge tip. Um, and that's really what I have, you know. Um, trust yourself, just be calm. If you have to retake it, it's not the end of the world. It, it wasn't fun, you know, I did have to pay for it again, but you know, I got through it the second time and that was that. So, you know, it happens to people, so you can do it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Brooke, that was great. All right, um, I'm just gonna go a couple of slides um, and, and for those of you that joined us a little bit late, we will share this with everybody. Um, I, several folks, um, reference the ASWB material. And please note, we're not necessarily recommending any one over the other. I, I think most folks have said that, um, you know, people find what works for them and what they find to be helpful um, and, and discourage you, you know, spending lots and lots of money. I think a lot of it has to come from our desire to, to do this. And there are resources you can try to find. ASWB does um, have, uh, their ASWB guide to the social work exam. You can purchase it di digitally for $15 and hard copy can be sent for $20 if you want to do that. That, Though, honestly, do you need that? You know, I think it depends. There's a lot of information on the website that is free. That, so when you have free time, it, it is a really good idea to just sit it on the ASWB website and read all of the information they have. There is a, an exam guide. Um, on there that's free that you can take a look at um, and it will just help you. The more you learn about this exam, the, the less you demystify it and, and uh, the easier it is, I think, to, to prepare for it. Um, so there's the candidate handbook that's free that I just mentioned. So if you go to the ASWB website, you can get that. And then the guide to the exam is the one that, that's $20 or 15 if, if you get it electronically. Um, there's a, a free download that 
So I think Aubrey's the one who referenced the KSA's uh, knowledge, skills, abilities. The exam uh, outline has those listed for, and so you can download the the uh, outline and it will tell show you how much, what percentage of questions are in each area. So it'll just give you an idea, like X percent covers um, uh, ethics, for example. And, and it is true, whether you're taking the clinical or the advanced generalist, there is a lot of micro content on both exams. Um, so don't assume that if you're taking the advanced generalist that you don't have to worry about that. Unfortunately, you do. And so you need to, to have all of that. And I, I don't know if um, Lakita mentioned taking the practice exam, if she was, ref were you referring to the ASWB practice exam that you purchased for the 30 days? Well, I did purchase that one too, but I was speaking to the one that the university typically offers, but I did take that one too. I took a million. Gotcha. Yeah. And you know, so they do offer one for $85 that the last time I looked, it, it still said 85 and you you have access to it for 30 days. If you, you know, and it, I think as many exams as you can find, particularly if they're free, the idea I think, and we heard each panelist say, the more opportunities you have to practice, the, the more comfortable you are uh, at taking these exams. Um, for those of us that have anxiety about taking standardized exams, I think the more you take them, the more comfortable you are, and the less the anxiety I think goes down a little bit. So um, something to kind of keep in mind. And then these are, let me, these are the, this is the slide where I, I asked each panelist to send, a, send me what resources they use. And so these are links to the resources they use. So we'll send this out to everybody. But some of these are from the library. And I know Brooks require that you have access to library. Like the, these are from Wayne State. But if some of you might have access at other libraries, I know the internet, interlibrary alone, sometimes you can get these. Um, and then some of these are free and some may not be free. So just be mindful of that. So um, what I'd like to do next is I'm gonna stop sharing and, and come back to our big group. And um, as I'm doing that, I have made Dr. Takesha LaShore, Dr. Chantelia Johns and Sarah Doyle co-hosts. And I, I know they've been keeping track of questions. So it might be easier if we have them um, identify questions that have been posed that haven't been answered, and then I'll op open it up to uh, each of our panelists to respond to the questions. So um, uh, to Keisha, uh, Dr. Lashore, if you wanna maybe start. Yeah, so one of the largest, um, well, one of the more consistent questions that I'm seeing um, is that uh, there's concern about how this authorization with the state of Michigan works. Um, so I've seen it happen a couple of different ways. One, I've seen individuals register with ASWB um, and pay the fee, and then ASWB makes contact with the state of Michigan and receives the authorization. But I've also seen um, individuals make contact with the state of Michigan directly after registering with ASWB to have that authorization sent. Keep in mind that uh, the Bureau um, for Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, the Social Work Division is not a very large division. And typically there are high period times, especially around graduation. So if you're submitting those requests around May or around December, you're gonna get um, kind of put in queue. So just keep in mind that it's okay to email them or follow up with a phone call to ensure that those authorizations are taking place. And the authorization, I believe, is only good for a year. So if you, let's say, you decide to get the authorization right after you graduate, but then you don't end up um, scheduling or taking your exam for another year or so, then you might have to get the reauthorization. Dr. Johns, any questions that you see that you want to pose? Yeah, this is a question to the panelists. Um, Participant wondering how long it took for the um, individuals to take the exam. So we know they give us four hours, but for the panelists, what was it two hours for you? Three, the whole four hours? Kind of want to know a little bit more about the time frame regarding your experience at the exam. I know for me, I think I ended up at about three hours and 15 minutes. Um, but again, I did take about four bathroom breaks, so um, you can factor that in, but 
maybe about three, three fifteen or three thirty. It took Layla? me about two and a half hours. Two and a half. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I was just shy of the three hour mark. I, it took me, I had um, submitted the exam with like six or seven minutes left. I took a really long time. I, that's just me. Re I was very careful with reading the questions and getting up and using the bathroom. So by the time I had, you know, finished reading the questions and then going back through my flagged questions, I had about less than 10 minutes left. But it definitely, four hours is definitely plenty of time. Right. Sarah Doyle, you're on the call. Do you see any questions that have been posed that we haven't answered? Or Takesha, or? I have a question, a couple that I can uh, um, address. So the great thing is, is somebody, it looks like just called Laura and got their authorization fixed, so congratulations. Um, so they are in the office if you have questions. Um, the other question that I'm seeing, I think there was uh, someone needed clarification around how long you have to take the exam. So once you get that authorization, you only have a year on that authorization before you have to request another one. However, you get, uh, up to, you get up to six years max to take the exam under the limited license renewals. Um, so that's the initial plus the five renewals. Um, and at that time, you should, that, that's kind of your period of time you have to take the exam and pass it. And one of the key things um, I have definitely have heard Anwar talk about is if you are not practicing or accruing those hours, do not apply for that limited license because that is a hard and fast time frame. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Takesha. Um, some folks have been doing that. And then remember, the state only allows you to renew your limited license six times. So if you renew it six times and you don't have your 4,000 hours, you're not going to be able to keep renewing it. And then you're in a difficult spot because you can't take the exam unless you have a limited license in Michigan. The other thing I want to mention is, um, and this has come up, I don't know if this question came up, but up until... Up until this year, actually, and next year, folks could graduate with their master's degrees and then apply to take the exam whenever they wanted to. Starting in June of 2021, Laura will not allow you to take the exam until you demonstrate that you have 4,000 hours of, of supervised experience. So that means that folks who graduate um, after next year will have to wait until they have their 4,000 hours supervised by an, a licensed master social worker and then they can apply to take the exam and and aswb stance on that is that they feel that i both the clinical and the advanced generalist exams are not based on content from the master's program they suggest that yes of course you're learning content but then you pr apply that content after you graduate and you are accruing what is what they term practice wisdom and so you know remember when you have your limited license you're not having to uh, get CE because the idea is that you're being supervised so you should be continuing to to read material to apply the material you're reading to get supervision and that and making sure that you have that that knowledge and the idea is that when you have the 4,000 hours you're in a better place than to take the exam so that is controversial. Some people feel that they do better when they take the exam right out of school. Others say, no, you shouldn't do that. But regardless of where we stand on this issue, starting June of 2021, Lara will require that folks demonstrate they have the 4,000 hours of supervised experience before you can take the exam. So just something to be mindful about. Another question that came up, someone was uh, indicating that you can request more time for medical reasons or for English as a second language. That must be done at the time of registration. You cannot sit for the exam and then request additional accommodations. So that is part of the registration process. So if you need that time, you need to make sure that you have the opportunity to do that during the point of registration. They will not, at the testing site, they do not have the authorization or the ability to authorize additional time. 
Um, someone also asked about memory supplements. I would always say check with your physician uh, to find out what would work best for you because everybody's physiological makeup is different. So what works for one person may not necessarily work for um, another. Um, and then someone was inquiring about the APGAR text. Um, I do know a couple folks that have used that and have had some, so, some success. Um, but what I would say do is if you're looking at specific study materials to go onto Amazon and actually preview the book, you want to make sure it's written in the language that you learn best in. Um, so actually reviewing that and making sure that it, it feels comfortable for you. Um, Anwar, I'm not sure if you spoke about reciprocity across states, but someone asked if you can take um, the LCSW in any state. And I'm not sure if they're referring to the authorization or if they're referring to reciprocity of full licensure. Got it. Yeah, so I, we didn't talk about that, but I will. Um, the, there are only, at the master's level, there are only two exams. It's, well, actually, I should, I'll rephrase that. There are three, but Michigan only uses two. The, when you look on the ASWB website, you'll see that they, they, have some, they have an exam called a master's exam. We don't use that in Michigan. Ohio uses it, for example, for students who just graduate and when they apply to our equivalent of the limited license, which is the first exam, excuse me, the first um, license type that you can apply for when you graduate. In Michigan, you don't need an exam for that. You just, you, all you have to do is fill out an application, pay the fee, show that you have your master's degree, and then you can get your limited license. It's called LLMSW, Limited License Master Social Worker. In Ohio, they have an equivalent, I don't know what it's called, but to get that limited license, you have to pass the master's exam. It's based on MSW content, really. So in Michigan, once you have your limited license, you, and you, then you get your two years of, of supervised experience and you pass the exam, you then can um, take the, either the clinical or the advanced generalist, and then you move from limited to full license. Once you take the exam, if you decide to move to another state, you would obviously not have to take that exam again. There is no reciprocity in the full sense because reciprocity means that if Michigan and Ohio had a reciprocity contract, it means that if you were licensed in Michigan and you moved to Ohio, you can practice in Ohio and vice versa. There is no, I don't know of any state that has reciprocity. What, when you move from one state to another, you have to go to that state's licensing board and look at the process to apply for a licensure you do not have to retake the exam. Once you take the exam, because it's the same exam for all of the states, you would just need to contact ASWB and they would send your license or your exam score to the state you're moving to. And, and then you just fill out the application for that state. So you would not have to take the exam, but you do have to go through the steps of applying for that license. If that answers the question, I think. Um, Someone did ask about the testing site itself, um, and I, I recall even when I took my exam, the security uh, for Pearson View. Um, it is intense, so make sure you read the Pearson View's website about the level of security, the nature of identification, what you will have to do to gain entry into the room. Um, they do not allow anything except a blank sheet of paper and a pencil that they give you in your ID that has been reviewed, scanned, and cleared of all markings that did not come with it when it was issued. Um, and this is done because Pearson View has security measures for LSATs, for MCATs, for GRE, um, as well as for state licensing exams for all professions. Um, so it is a security measure that they not allow anything into the testing area. Um, and I, I would imagine because they've seen way more than we have um, in terms of, of, of students or, or people trying to um, sneak things into the testing site. They do, however, have lockers um, on site. So if you have, um, like I think someone said something about low blood glucose, um, they will allow you to bring like a water or um, your keys um, a snack, something to that state, but it has to be put into the locker and you have to have, again, made them aware before you go into test that you may need some accommodations for that. Yeah. I, I've seen this question come up a couple of times. Is the exam changing in 2021? No. It, um, Association of Social Boards usually does, does a, what is called an, a scan 
basically it's an environmental scan of, of the field of social work. They send out a survey to social workers across North America and then they do a, a, a content analysis of those about those responses and they use that content analysis to determine if the exam needs to be changed. It was just changed maybe two, three years ago. And so it, it's not going to change in 2021. It's the same one that they have different versions of the, of the exam. So you could be sitting next to someone and taking the clinical exam and, it, and they just, it could be a different version. They change the questions. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. Um, and then someone asked about taking the exam during COVID and Brooke spoke to that. So I'll let her answer that again. Yeah, um, I wanted to mention, um, you do have to wear a mask and when they take your picture, you do have to take your mask down. Um, they didn't ask me to take my mask off to look inside of it, but they did ask me to re remove it, you know, so they could take my picture. Um, so that was um, probably one of the only things that I had to do. Um, and beyond that, you have to sanitize um, before entering. Um, but you can still use the lockers. You still get the pen and paper. I didn't think they were going to give us that, but they still do. Um, everything else is the same. So it was just, just a couple of different things. Um, and you're spaced out more, which I actually appreciated. So yeah. um, you can still use the noise canceling headphones, although I chose not to. Um, that's your personal preference. Um, you're reminding me, Brooke, of um, several years ago, one of our graduates called me in a panic because she had gone in to take the exam and um, she probably shouldn't, she should have, if something, you know, she had a situation and her mom had been hospitalized and she was worried. And I, she said later, I should have not gone in to take the exam. I, my head wasn't in it because I was worried, but she took a break uh, to go to the bathroom and had her cell phone and called somebody to find out how her mom was doing. Well, the center knew she made the call. I mean, they are really, yeah, serious. really serious about their, um, uh, about the exam because and I, the reason they're that serious is they they spend a lot of money creating this exam and so if they feel that the exam is being um uh if people are are trying to steal questions they have an attorney that that is on retainer and they'll go after people if they do that i remember reading an article about this guy who was who was helping a group of people to prepare for the exam and he asked each of them to, to memorize a question and, and answers and come back and then he wrote it up and he shared it and so they're usually scanning things so be, be mindful of that don't take your phone in just leave it in the car and I would say just be careful with that you if you do take your phone in um, that you have to put it in a sealed um, bag and you seal it right in front of them and put it in your locker so you can, I mean, if you do want to take it, it has to be powered down um, and put into the sealed bag. So you can take it in, but um, just be mindful that they are going to ask you to do that. I've seen a couple of questions come through. Um, they do provide the noise canceling headphones for you. Someone asked how many exam, how many um, versions of it. And I want to, I want to clarify that. So we're talking about two different exams, right? There is the clinical exam and the advanced generalist. The clinical is for people that are trying to get the clinical license and the advanced generalist is for people who are, who are trying to get the macro designation of the license in Michigan. Can you do both? Yes, I'll talk about that. And be, before I do that, it, let me just say that, um, so ASWB has a, has a bank of questions. They, they, I forget how many, I used to know at some point. So for each exam, remember I said there was 170 questions on each exam, 20 of them are new questions that they're testing to see if they're good questions. So you don't get, mar you're not uh, evaluated on those. They just use them to see if everybody, if there's a large number of people that don't get them correct, they pull it and try to change the question. So what they do, they might have like four versions of the clinical exam. So if, you're, if you go into a center and there's 10 of you taking the exam, the person next to you may or may not be taking the same version because they, they put different questions because they pull them from a bank. And then even in the, with an exam that has the same questions, they change the, the order of the questions. So if you're sitting next to someone who's taking the same exam version, your questions might not be in the same order. So that's what I meant to say about that. Um, and I forgot the second point I was going to make. I think that's uh, just to, to follow up because there were some questions about people that are saying that 
you know, they want to do private practice, so should they be doing advanced journalists or should they be doing clinical? You should be doing the exam that matches where you're getting your experience. So if you are being supervised by under a clinical, uh, fully licensed individual and you're doing clinical work, that should be the exam that you're prepping for. Um, so for example, my, my master's was a clinical uh, specialization, a clinical concentration, but I was doing uh, macro level work after graduation. So my exam was the advanced generalist. So make sure it matches. Um, I also had a minor in, in leadership administration, so it fit. Um, because what you don't wanna do is register for an exam where you have not been gaining experience or prepare, making preparations. Um, so make sure that uh, you know that going in so that you know what you should be studying. Um, there's also, um, there were a few questions around how will you know how much research is on there? How do you know how much is going to be related to policy? I really encourage folks to review the ASWB website because they actually give you that information around different areas you should be studying. Um, and it, it gives you a breakdown of how many percentage of questions might be related to each of those areas that if anything sounds like a foreign language, you'll know where to start, um, so to speak. Um, but really just looking at that website and making notes uh, so that you know what things you understand and what things you might need support with. You reminded me, Takesha, what I was going to say. So if, if you do, and I totally, Takesha has it on the mark, obviously if you're working in a clinical setting and that's where you're headed, you want to take the clinical exam. Let's say that your role changes and you're doing more macro work and you want to now add the other um, uh, designation to your license if you're in Michigan, so you want to have both the clinical and the macro. The You do have to take the second exam again, but you also have to show that you have 2,000 hours of experience in that area under the supervision of someone who has that designation. And then you, um, they used to allow you to do it without exam, but then the rules changed and, and then they now require you to take the exam, the other exam to have that designation added to your license. And that was, thank you, someone reminded me of what that point, second point I was trying to make. So, others, Chantelia, Sarah, other questions that we've missed? Keisha, anything? Feel free. Someone asked, so would it be better to try and take the exam before June of 2021? I, I would, you know, this is one of those, I don't think that there is a right answer or a wrong answer to this. I think it depends on um, kind of what, the, what kind of learner you are in a sense, I would say, and, and maybe the panelists want to respond. My person, this is personal, right? This is my personal opinion is that it doesn't, I don't, I don't think you should rush to take it just to take it before that date. I think it matters more how prepared you feel you are to take this exam. You know, um, and, and really, I, I loved each panel has talked about having a plan, and I think that's really important, that this is not a kind of exam that you want to rush and take just because you want to take it early. You really should have a plan in place about how you're going to practice. I loved the idea of having accountability, whether, it, whether it's having a partner or a supervisor that you work with, because, you know, this is a high stakes exam. And so the more prepared you are, not just in terms of content, but in your head and emotionally, and, and if, if you know that you're anxious, that you're the kind of person who's anxious, then think about doing something about that. Think about, you know, talking to someone, um, you know, find out ways that, things that you can do to, to get the, that um, anxiety level down and uh, measures you can take when you feel an anxious that, so that if you're sitting in that room, um, I think Brooke mentioned, just stop looking at the screen and maybe close your eyes, take a deep breath. I mean, I think those are all things you have to be mindful of and have to be in the, in the planning of what do I need for me to be ready to take the exam? Not because what Elena said or what Brooke said or Aubrey, all of those things I can take and put in my head and then think about who I am and what my needs are. So I don't think I answered your question, but I, and I invite my colleagues on the panel to share their response. Yes, Anwar, I have a question for you. Someone um, is asking, is there a, a time that they should focus on one question? 
like a mm. maximum amount of time. I, and I'm going to make a comment and then you answer whatever the textbook answer is. But I think that's why it's very important to practice the exam beforehand to see where you are. So let's focus where you are. And if we say, OK, maybe I'm spending too much time, then you can work on it from that way, opposed to saying, oh, my goodness, I have to only spend 45 seconds on this question. I don't think that would be the most useful way of thinking about it. Yeah. I, I love that. Other other panelists have any suggestions? Yeah, so I kind of going back to wit, feeling when you're ready for the exam. I knew that I was ready for the exam when I got to a point where I was like, I don't know what to study anymore. Like I have studied all of the KSAs. I've taken a few practice exams. And now, it, like, after reviewing my flashcards, I was like, okay, like, what else is, what more is there to study? And that's really when I knew personally, like, okay, I think that I'm ready for this. And um, I don't know, I did see another question about um, needing to have your 4,000 hours in, but I think that is only applicable for people who graduate in 2021. After June, right after June. Yeah. So if you're not a student currently, if you are a recent graduate, then that does not apply to you. Right. Right. And I, I don't know that there's a textbook answer, Elaine. I, I liked what you said. And I think if you take a practice exam and you have a sense of how long it takes you, um, then I think think about how, how much time you want to spend on a question. And I think Lakidra was, and, and maybe um, Brooke mentioned this too, if you get stuck on a question, don't, don't psych yourself out, right? Uh, this is where you flag a question and say, this one, I think I need to come back to. On the other hand, you don't wanna to flag too many questions, right? So, but if there's one that you just, like I'm stuck on this and I can't figure it out, and then you don't want that to, to impact you the rest of the exam. So flag it and continue and then go back and then, um, then go back to that question so that you've given yourself time to answer the other questions that you felt more comfortable with and then you can kind of deal with it. But if you're flagging every other one, that's problematic, right? You wanna make sure that you're trying to get as much done as, as you can. And this is where every, each panel has said this, taking the practice exam gives you a sense of that. And I, I think I would add, you're not taking the practice exam to study content. Please don't think that, right? Cause you're gonna take a lot of practice exams that will have different, what you're doing is, is I think learning the pace the type of exam, getting comfortable with this kind of an exam. And this is one of those exams where, you know, when you read the questions, they're all there. Each question has a stem. So the, the kind of what the question is or the vignette or what the situation might be. And then they give you four answers, always four answers, A, B, C, and D. And there, there is never a A and B, there is never an all of the above or none of the above there is one answer to every question so and here's this is why this exam is difficult for many of us when you read the question and you're looking at the answers every answer could be potentially correct for that question sometimes and what you have to really this is why reading becomes important and if you're anxious and, and you use anxiety to, or you're using your energy to deal with the anxiety, you may not, you miss, you may miss some important aspect of the question. So the more relaxed and the more prepared you are, you're better able to read the question and you won't miss important clues in the question. So I think all of us have seen questions where they highlight or um, bold a, a part of the question that says, what's the first thing you, you would do in this situation for a question? Well, all the, all the answers are things you might do, but what's the first thing, right? So taking practice exams helps you to learn those nuances and, and get a sense of the, the kinds of questions. The content is gonna come from reading material. And I think every panel has talked about how they, you know, when they read and they talked about things that complicated content with their colleagues to help kind of uh, figure out uh, something that didn't make sense. And then there are some major uh, areas, you know, I think I heard several people reference like the, um, uh, the, the um, oh, my brain, it's the end of the day. Aubrey, I think you were the one who mentioned this. The, the like, um, I just need to stop talking right now and have you guys do that. 
It's gone. I have, I have to, uh, another thought bouncing off what you were saying. So some of the questions will give you, they'll give you the vignette and they'll say, the question will say, using psychodynamic theory, what is your response? And so that the answer to that would look different than it would be the same exact scenario, but if the question was using CBT, what would your response be? So that, that question is the, the wording, the language in that question is really key to what your, your answer will be. Right. Again, it's, you know, thinking about the key words and the language. Oh, hi. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> when you're anxious, you can think about looking at a baby like this baby and feel calm down a little bit, right? I love it. Yeah. I, you talked about things like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and that's what I, my brain just wouldn't pick that up. There are certain concepts that I think are key. We all we've learned them. So when you're when you're studying, you want to pull those kinds of things up. And the outline that ASWB has is having that is helpful when you're trying to figure out what reading material you want to look at. Um, the DSM obviously is important. I don't think we've brought that up because there are a lot of questions on the exam that come out of that. So um, a library is a good place to get information. Um, and I think the PowerPoint or um, the one PowerPoint where I have each of our panelists um, recommended material, I think includes some of that. So we'll make sure we send that out to everybody. It's 427, we said we'd do an hour and a half. Um, is there any last minute um, question from, Anyone? We'll, we'll take like one more, and then we'll we'll stop so that we end at at four thirty. Okay. Can you hear me? My name is yes. Latina Johnson. Hi. And listening to you guys, it makes me feel good, but it also makes me feel bad because I've taken the test eight times. Oh. So, but you know, to hear someone saying like they passed it on the first try or the second try. But I know it's not my time. And do you have any suggestions for me? I'm sorry. I can hear the frustration, obviously. Because um, I'm embarrassed. Oh, please. Yeah, please I, don't I, beat I, yourself up. Right, right. I, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll share this and I you know I fancy myself an academic I, I work with the school of social work and I think on the panel at least three of the four young ladies were my students um and I didn't pass it on the first try right so there are interventions that we have to take when we don't succeed at our goal the first time around and if you want to have those conversations I know Anwar is available I would be available because I think what needs to happen is we have to determine how you learn best, what okay. life circumstances are you facing right now, and what supports you need in order to get a very clear study schedule, study guide in mm -hmm. your hands to be able to move you forward with successful completion of this exam. I will also say, um, take a deep breath, right? Because as soon as we hear the word exam, right. social workers run away. Right, we, we will hear ex word, the word exam or we'll hear the word math and we're like, we're done, right? Uh -huh. So really we have to put things in place that make you feel supported, not feel embarrassed. Yeah, this is not what our profession does. Our profession looks at what do you need to do and how do we bring out your strengths to be able to get you through this exam. Uh -huh. So I think you might have been the one um, that I was writing some comments to that you need an accountability buddy or a study buddy or a group. So if we okay. can facilitate that through this, we, that, that itself is a win. Yes. I also okay. just want to note too, um, I don't know what you've been experiencing, um, if it's some anxiety that's in there too, but also just, um, or even if you've tried it, but just considering some accommodations too for test day. Um, I know, like I mentioned, I had anxiety around taking the exam leading up to it and constantly putting it off. Mm -hmm. And I did talk with my um, mentor about possibly looking at accommodations to take a written paper exam versus taking the exam on the computer because the computer what was, oh, was what yeah. was. Yeah. So maybe, I mean, maybe that's not your option, but you know, there are many ways you can um, ask for accommodation. So that might be something you want to talk through as well. 
Okay. I mean, because it's not like I'm far off. I'm like seven off, five off, mm-hmm. four off. So I feel like I'm not just jacking off. I'm not mm-hmm. just not doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm all around it. I've been taking this test since 2017. So it's not mm-hmm. like, you know, I, I'll take it every three or four months. You know, sometimes I say, okay, I'm going to give myself a break. I'm going to give myself six months. So, you know, over a period of three years, I took it eight times. And it's, 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 it's and then people start saying, well, you know, uh, well, what do you need to do? What, you know, just ask you all type of stupid questions. And it's just like, I don't know. Yeah. And I think that it's, the, for- it's asking you to have that level of insight versus figuring out how we could test to determine what that looks like. So I'm not sure if you've come into the school, like I've, I've been writing in the message box that while the school is currently closed, once we reopen, we will be allowed to bring our alums as well as our community partners into the school to take the practice exam. What that then allows you to do is actually do a deep dive and analysis of what areas are your strongest, what areas are you not as strong in, or if there's some content. Because for most Mm -hmm. of our our alums, if you graduated under um, an educational policy and standards that were, you know, four or five, six years ago, we're teaching something different, which means the exam looks different. So we need to make sure that we're putting not only refresher content, but the new content that you need for evidence-based practice and best models in place as well. So I think it may, may feel like going to school in some regards, um, but it's really figuring out how best uh, to support you through that. So one of the things I would encourage folks to do with the time we have left, you have the ability to chat to everyone, but you also have the ability in the chat box to send contact information directly to each other. So share okay. your contact information. I know a few of you were thinking about study groups or accountability partners. Um, so feel free to do that while the, the Zoom meeting goes through its conclusion. Um, but also know that you can access our content on the school website. So our phone numbers as well as our email addresses are on there. So that if you need to be linked in to other folks, alums and folks that were on this call, we can help facilitate that as well. Absolutely. I got a question. Can I ask a question? Sure, I think Aubrey, Aubrey had something to say and then, and then you can ask your question. Go well, ahead. you can hear me though, right? Yes, yes we oh, can. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for sharing that experience with us. I know that is not easy and um, I'm gonna give my contact information to Anwar. So when she sends out this um, presentation that if you wanna reach out to me individually, um, mm-hmm. feel free to reach out be happy to to chat that's great Thank you. i'll just remind before the gentleman asks this question when we uh, we're, we've been recording this and i think we can i'm michaela am i correct that we can also keep the chat so we can include that information as well and send it out um i don't actually know okay uh, we'll check on that I, I do believe there's a way to do that um but i think there was a gentleman who said he had a question I yeah can you hear me Yes, go for it. Oh, I'm Mr. I'm Mr. De Jesus. I just graduated from Wayne State. I took I took the uh, I went into and took the and took the, and went into the macro program, the leadership. The okay. macro. But um, my question is this: um, It's two type of exams, the clinical and the generalist. Now, since I graduated, I haven't got the de- the paper degree yet. Okay, from the school. So I don't know what it says on the degree. But my question is this. Do I have to, since I graduated from, in, from the macro program, do I have to take the generalist exam or can I take the clinical? That should be an easy question for me to answer. And, and it can be in one way. So I, I'm going to say to you, if you... If you graduated with an NSW and, and your concentration was our innovation and community policy leadership, our macro concentration, typically you'd be working, most likely you'd be working, doing work that is in, in that area. Remember I said most folks don't take the exam right out of school. So if you're, you know, the idea that it, when you graduate and you start working in the field that you're interested in, in the area that you're interested in, then you're, most folks then get their experience in one, either the clinical or the macro area. So 
after after those four thousand hours of practice experience, those are going to be either one or the other area, right? So that's going to help you decide which exam to take because typically I would say if you graduate a macro and you're working in a macro area, then you're getting your four thousand hours. Of I hear you. I don't mean to cut you off. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but you're missing my question. My question is this, okay? I can take, just because I graduated, just because I graduated in the macro program, I can take, because I'm interested, I'm interested in clinical work. But I did, I did the macro for the leadership. But I'm, into, I'm all over the place. I'm interested in both. What I'm saying is, since I graduated from the macro program, it's not mandatory um, as far yeah, okay. as, I, it's I not mandatory, for, hold on, it's not mandatory for me to take the generalist. I could, I, I could take the clinical if I want to, right? You could. I mean, the state doesn't look at your concentration. They okay. just want to see that you have your master's degree. But what I would say to you is, you know, um, mm -hmm. the kind of job you're going to have, and, the, and remember, the exams have a lot of, like, the advanced generalist is not just is not just uh, macro content. It does cover um, uh, micro content, clinical content. So that's important to note. I think all of the panelists mentioned that. And, and I think Aubrey and, and Brooke, you guys took the advanced generalist, right? And then yeah. Elena and, and Lakidra, you took the clinical, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. And I think all four of you would agree that, so there might have been more questions that were focused on macro for the advanced journalist, but there was a significant amount of questions that were on, on the advanced journalist that were clinical. So. Yeah, but the thing yeah. about my, this is what I'm saying though, I understand what you're saying, but if I go, like I've been offered so I, I've been, I've been applying for clinical work, okay, and when I, when I'm, when I'm on, when I'm on uh, looking at the jobs and stuff, okay, they want you to be fully licensed. Okay, clinical. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So uh, a generalist uh, a license ain't gonna help me when they're looking for a licensed clinical therapist. You with me? If I go in, and that's the direction that I'm probably gonna end up going because this is more work, and I ain't got no experience even in my field work, and all my experience is working in the micro area. But I took the macro, and I'm I'm saying to myself that I make a mistake. I don't know that I, I, I you know, so I, we obviously don't have a lot of time to spend on this, and, and I'm happy to chat with you. You right. can definitely decide which exam to take. I think um, I think it, it's important to be mindful of prep, like making sure that you have the preparation to do the work that you're going to be engaging. In. You know, you shared that you had experiences prior to the master's program. So that's good. You know, you take that with you, obviously, and you built on that through your experiences, classes and field work while you're in the master's program. Um, One other quick question, real quick. Now, I went, I went, I went immediately and, and applied for the license, the uh, limited license, and I got it right here. And then I went back today because I couldn't remember. And I, when you do the application, for the, and it asks you, it asks you micro, I mean, uh, macro or micro. And I believe since I already had a, I graduated from the macro program, I checked the box for macro with Laura and them. Is that going to make a difference as uh, far as when I sign up to take the test? No. No. So let me say this, when you, when folks, graduated when they apply for their limited license. Remember, the limited license doesn't ask what, what uh, designation. It's a limited license, so it's not, it's a, it doesn't require that you indicate either clinical or, or uh, macro. When you move from limited to full license, that's when you have to indicate the designation you want, and then the exam is, in, is then identified. So that's when you say, okay, I want to take this one, the clinical or the macro, and then, and, and you indicate that at that time when you move up from limited thank, to full. Thank y'all so much. You're welcome. Thank you for the whole, th the whole thing was great. I've got a lot, ton of information and I good. thank y'all so much. Good, good, you're welcome. And, and so that, that's a good segue for me. I know we stayed a little bit over and so I appreciate everyone's patience. 
I, I want to again so much thank uh, Lakidra Browner, Elena Brown, Aubrey Gilliland, and Brooke Rodriguez for they when I asked them they they didn't hesitate they all like happily agreed to do this and prepared material and send it to me and they've been gracious with their time and wonderful in their support of of this. Uh, program and and to you. So I again will will get this material together and send it out to everybody. And um, I just thank them very very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank y'all. Thank y'all so thank much. Thank you all for coming all. and participating. Absolutely. Thank Have a you. wonderful rest of the day. Bye. Bye. Take Bye. care. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hey, Amwar, how are you?